All right, good morning, family. Happy Sunday. I'm going to invite you to find your seats if you would. Come on now. Don't make me come down there. <laughs> Oh, man. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Are you glad to be here today? Amen. Amen. Well, friends, it's really a wonderful privilege for us to have Pastor Grace Kladnick uh, bringing the word uh, this morning. Uh, ladies, by a round of applause, how many were at the fall women's luncheon yesterday? I heard it was fantastic, uh, as always, and that... Um, Grace brought such a wonderful word, and you guys just had such a great, great time together. So um, would you put your hands together and welcome Pastor Grace as she comes to minister today? Thank you. Hi, everyone. It is so wonderful to be with you. You look awesome. You've lost weight since the last time I was here. You look good. You found some weight? All right. Well, he gives and takes away. Um, <laughs> I just absolutely loved worshiping with you and the diversity in this room. Man, this is heaven. This is what heaven's going to look like. And it's just a really unique, beautiful thing to be a part of the church. And so why don't you, we did this yesterday with the girls, but why don't you just take a peek around at all the beautiful different faces Go ahead, this is your chance. If you're single, kind of wave so people know like who are the singles in the house that we can be just scoping out a little bit. But, <clears throat> but this is just such a beautiful room and <clears throat> what a wonderful church. Church at the table, I don't know if you know this, but this isn't what everyone does. <laughs> and there's something really unique and beautiful to sit at a table and uh, commune with one another, and hear each other's stories. I don't know how many times I've, grew, you know, I grew up in church, and I week in, week out would go to church, and I wouldn't share anything. I wouldn't say anything. Maybe an awkward hello during that, you know, meet and greet time, or no one ever got to know my story, and I didn't get to know anyone else's story, and it was really easy to be a judge in those, in those rooms, because I could just stand back and kind of judge someone's life or the way that they looked and never know them and never know their story. And we see in the early church, it looked much like this, sitting at a table and having a meal together and hearing each other. Where else are we going to get into a room with this many different colors and this many different backgrounds? and actually hear your story. And the one thing that unites us is Christ. That is so beautiful. You're a part of something really special and really unique. And I don't want you to take it for granted because this doesn't happen everywhere. Is it perfect here? No, I don't think that for a second. But that's what makes it even more special. Imperfect people coming together, looking to Jesus. Man, isn't it just awesome to be united by Christ? I just love that. That's what brings us all together is the cross. So I, I was here a year ago. I don't know if you were here when I was here, but I was here a year ago. And, um, <laughs> and so if I don't know you, my name's Grace. I live in the San Bernardino Mountains. I used to live in Los Angeles, and I'll talk about that a little bit. I lived in L.A. for 20 years, and this last August, so it's been a few months, um, my family, I have three daughters um, and my husband, and we moved about an hour and a half out of the city up to the mountains, and it's a very different way of life. So a lot has changed for me, but I have the privilege this morning of kicking off your fall series, and are you excited about that? Um, yes, I'm excited about it. And it's, it's called In Everything, Living a Thankful Life. I hate that. I hate that. In Everything, Live a Thankful Life. That's really pretty. And it sounds great on a postcard. 
But have you ever tried to live a life like that? Don't lie to me, guys. Have you ever tried to live a life like this in everything? I feel like as soon as November comes along, we have to be thankful for everything. And it's annoying, okay? It's annoying because it's Thanksgiving month and we have to be thankful. And there's just certain things I'm not very thankful for, okay? All right? Like parking. <laughs> parking lots. I'm supposed to be thankful for that? In November, I have to be. So this series is really leading us up to that Thanksgiving turkey. And who is a turkey fan and who is a ham fan? Or fro turkey. Any fro turkeys in the room? Let's pray for them right now. Jesus, we <laughs> extend your grace. Be thankful for that fro turkey. Um, but yes, we, we get to remind ourselves of being a thankful person, living a thankful life. And this month definitely highlights it a little bit more. If you sit around the Thanksgiving table, and I don't know about you, but our family always does this, what are you thankful for? Let's go around the table and talk about it. Um, but what does it look like to embody that kind of life? What does it look like to live a life of Thanksgiving in everything? So we're gonna dive into it. Our, our main verse is found in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. And I'm reading from uh, the NIV version. And so this verse says in verse 16, rejoice always. Turn to someone at your table and say, always. Pray continually. Turn to someone and say, continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Turn to someone and say, in all circumstances. Tell someone from another table, in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Can we pray? Lord, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for your word. May it do what it needs to do in me. I pray right now my ears, go ahead, you pray this for yourself. I pray my ears would be open. My spirit would be open. There would be no offense in me. God, I wanna hear your words to me today. I'm open, Lord. I'm teachable, God. I'm available. Speak to me, Lord, amen. So I'm gonna give you a little glimpse into my Bible study um, when I prep for a sermon, but more so just my everyday looking at the Word of God and studying it. I don't know about you, but sometimes that book is a little intimidating. Um, sometimes I open it up and I'm like, what in the world are they talking about? And um, I can get up here and pretend I know all the things, and I, I'm just going to let you know, I do not know all the things. Google is my helper many times. Many times I'm reading my Bible and I will, or Alexa. I have an Alexa in my house. It's my fourth child. And I'll say, Alexa, what does this mean? And sometimes her responses are funny. But um, when I study and I sit down, and especially something like this, I'm getting ready to preach, and I obviously want to preach the word of God and not just some idea that I have in my head. That would be scary. But I want to know what the word says, and I want to dive into it. And as you grow in your faith and as you grow with your relationship with the Lord, I would hope that, yes, you come to church on Sunday and you hear the word, but then you do something when you leave this place and you have a personal relationship with the word of God, that you don't just hear something like Facebook news feed that tells you what to believe, but it's designed by an algorithm that if you listen to certain things and watch certain things, it's going to tell you a certain narrative. Do you know what I'm talking about? So if you go through your life only li listening to other people's narrative of what the word says, and you are, it's like, it's like going to a restaurant. Have you ever done this? You go to a restaurant and you don't know what to order. And so when you walk by the other tables, you look at the other tables you're creepy, okay? Because they're just trying to eat their food. And you're looking, you're like, ooh, those potatoes look good. Okay, keep that in mind. And oh, that 
burger, okay, I might. Now, what if you went over there and after they ate, they had a piece of burger left and you said, I'm just gonna take that little piece of burger. You're good with that? Okay, I'm gonna take it and eat your slimy burger that you've been eating. Gross, right? How much do we do this with the word of God? Well, that looks good. Yeah, you ate most of it, but let me have a little bite of that. Where God's like, I want to teach you to cook. I want to teach you to even grow your own food. And what does it look like to put a seed in the ground and water it and watch it grow and then harvest it and cut it up and make you something something to eat? But you want to come to church every Sunday and take a bite out of Pastor B's burger. It'll get you going through the day. But what happens when he's gone? What happens when you go to work the next day? What happens when you face a trial that you're too embarrassed to talk to, to anybody else about? Do you have the word of God planted inside of you? Do you have the word of God so close to you that when, when trial hits, when hard times hit, you're not running, Pastor Cynthia! You're going, Jesus. Your word is true and I'm standing on it. And then maybe someone's walking by your table. Oh, that looks good. What do they got? And you slap her hand away when they try to get your burger. So get your own. No, just kidding. But then you get to serve and you get to show another. And hopefully it brings something up in them where they are, have a hunger. When I was standing here in worship, I said, this is a hungry room. They are hungry for the presence of God. And you might have come in here and said, I'm not hungry for the presence of God, but guess what? You got swept up in the current that was happening in this room of a people of God that are hungry for him. You have to starve out those other, you ever go, I'm talking a lot about food, I'll get to this message. (laughs) But Mexican food is so good. But if you go to Mexican food and you eat all the chips and salsa, Come on, when the meal comes, what, what do you say? I'm so full. And then you still eat the tacos, but it's okay. You need to starve out some things out of your life so you are hungry for the things of God. You need to allow yourself to get uncomfortable in the hunger and let it stir the heart of God. Your pastor will not do that for you. Some podcast you listen to will not do that for you. A book you read, the knowledge that you have, the degrees you have will not do it for you. You've got to starve out those things. So all that you hunger for, all that you seek is his righteousness. And the only thing that will satisfy you is his presence. We are living in a day that there is so much distraction. There are so many things that can satisfy your flesh and you feel full but then you go to try to run down the street and you have no energy because it doesn't sustain you. How can you fill yourself? Sorry, I came in hot. So when I read and I study, the first thing I do is I pray for that hunger. because sometimes it doesn't just come naturally. I want to get on Instagram and I want to scroll. I want to go shop. I want to go fill myself. I want to go talk to other people and not talk to him. You know, I just, these aren't even bad things. They're just things that get in the way. And so the first thing I do is I just start to ask some questions. I get really curious. Tell someone, get curious. Come on, tell somebody at your table, get curious. So when we start to dive into 1 Thessalonians, the first thing that we need to see is the author of this book. And why is this important? It's important to know who was writing this, why were they writing it, and how can I get a glimpse of what maybe God wants to speak to me today? This isn't an ancient book that's dead and doesn't speak to us. It's alive and it's active So it still speaks to us today. Come on, show me any book that would do that. The Apostle Paul wrote this book. He wrote, and these are actually letters to the Church of Thessalonians. 
And he wrote, he wrote the, the book of First and Second Thessalonians. And then I started to think, okay, so Paul wrote this. And then I started to think about Paul's life. Man, that guy, does he have a story, right? And his name was, used to be Saul, but he had this radical encounter with Jesus. And this was after Jesus had died, resurrected, ascended back to heaven. And he's on the road to Damascus, ready to persecute. And, and, and he's furious that these Jews, he's a Jew himself, he's furious that these Jews would listen and follow after this Jesus. How dare they? say that he was the Messiah. How dare they? And he was enraged. And his job and his mission was to persecute those that believed that. And then Jesus got a hold of his life on a road, mind in his own business, doing the thing he felt so deep in his spirit was the right thing. And Jesus intervened. Jesus intervened, changed his life. Paul changed his name from Saul to Paul. Paul surrendered his life to Jesus, and he started on this journey of following after Jesus, and he would go to town to town, and he would preach, and people would give their lives to Jesus, and obviously, there's a lot more to Paul's life. You'll have to read it. You'll have to Google it yourself, and... Um, um, but he would preach, and he would go from town to town, and this is how the church was born, People would give their lives to Jesus and he might stay for a while and other disciples might stay for a while and teach and show them what it was like to live a life. It's like kind of like your pastor, right? They come and they, you know, they're trying to give you some ideas and knowledge of the word of God and how to live a life that's following after Jesus. And he would stay for a time and then he would move on and another church would be planted in another community. And, and all these years later, look at us now. Can't stop a move of God. Although he was a Jewish man, he had such a heart to reach the Gentiles. And Gentile is just a person who's not Jewish. He went from this place of being so radically passionate about who he was as a Jewish man. And when he encountered Jesus, that was no longer his identity. His identity was a Christ follower. And that propelled him to go preach to a people and be so passionate about a people group that before he despised, before he would not be caught in a room with, before he would not have a passion to reach. And that's what the gospel does to us. And it forced him to get outside of his own comfort zone, outside of his own understanding and knowledge and want to reach a people group that he knew was so desperate to know who Jesus was. He went from persecuting to preaching. And then he himself was persecuted, thrown in jail time after time after time, eventually martyred for his faith. This community where this church in Thessalonians was, it was much like San Francisco. It was a bustling seaport city. It had um, important communications and trade centers, people coming in and going out, bringing what was happening there to the other parts of the world. It was the largest city in Macedonia. It's the capital of its province. It's very influential. Why is this important? A church was planted there. A people encountered Jesus and a church was planted and a community of bought, a community started to form in a city that had much influence. You can relate to this. You are planted in a city of much influence. And these people were planted there. And so why did Paul write this book or this letter back to this church? So many say that he was there for a time and abruptly had to get up and leave, maybe because of persecution, maybe because of something that was happening. But then he was gone for a while and said, well, how can I encourage? He started to hear stories back from the people. And he started to hear that they were, they were doing awesome. Oh my gosh, they were on fire for God and they were, they were spreading the word of, of Jesus, but they were under immense persecution. I don't know about you. I mean, I lived in Los Angeles a long time. There was just certain things I couldn't say out loud 
or I would feel like judged immediately. Even saying I was a Christian. The hardest one was when people say, what do you do for a living? And I'm like, do I have to tell them I'm a pastor? You know, I remember my husband one time, he's so sweet. My husband's also a pastor and he was at the park with our kids and he came home. He's like, I made a friend. And then I lost the friend when I told him I was a pastor. I was like, baby, I'm so sorry, you know? It's not always popular to believe the things that we believe, to believe the person we believe. It's not always popular. And I think um, Paul encountered this a little bit, and he's like, I still have a work to do, and it's not to stay here, so I gotta go, but I'm gonna write a letter back to you, and I'm gonna encourage you. And this letter was to encourage the believers that were there. They had seen many of their friends and their family persecuted already, and they were confused because they thought, no, 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 we're gonna be here until Jesus returns. And then people started to be murdered and killed for, the, for their faith and their beliefs, and so Paul got word that they were confused. What happened? I thought we were here until Jesus returned. And so he was writing a letter back. So let me explain some things to you. Doesn't quite work that way. You will see Jesus one day. And your friends and your family are with Jesus now. So he's, he's writing them and he's, in, he's encouraging them. And, and, and much of this letter, though it's vast and it has different ideas and different encouraging points that he gives, the subject of eschatology is, through, is woven through each page, really, at, at the end of every chapter. And what that is is just the study, the doctrine of the last things. And so many people love to debate this right now. Are we in the last days? Can I just tell you, um, you don't know your last day, so yes. I just don't have time to debate. Yes, you are, because who knows when your last day is? Do you know what I mean? So like, yeah, if you wanna have a bunker and like because you're in the, okay. But like, I don't, I, don't, I don't gotta get into it, I'm so sorry. But Paul is talking about this doctrine of the last things and the last day and, it, he, and he's trying to remember, remind them, keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. That's what I was gonna say about the bunker thing. If you have a bunker, God bless you and I probably will call you if something needs to happen but but he's trying to encourage them, keep your eyes on Jesus. And how do you do that in the, in the, when you're confronted by persecution and you're confronted by these difficult, hard things? How do you keep your eyes on Jesus? So that's woven through this whole um, letter back to this church. The primary aim of 1 Thessalonians is to encourage Jesus believers to continue to progress in their faith, to continue to move forward. It's an encouragement. It's, it's, it's teaching them how to live countercultural to the life that was all around them. You're in this life. You see it. You see the, 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 uh, the pull to live a certain way and to believe a certain thing. And even in that day, Paul was saying, yeah, 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 I see it. I see the culture. This is not new, you guys. Culture is not new. It's not new, and it's not new to the word of God. And Paul is writing back and saying, I see the culture, I see what is happening, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you, and I'm gonna encourage you how to live a life of holiness, separate, separated from the way that the culture is living, still living within it, but separate, holy. Does anyone need to know how to live that way? I sure do, I sure do. So we can still apply these truths that we're learning from Paul that he's writing a letter back to a church that was under persecution and, and it was a young church. These are young believers. They know just a little bit. You have the whole word of God and you still don't read it. They didn't have the word of God. They're just trying to remember and they're trying to believe and they're trying to have this, they're, they, they're having encounters with the Holy Spirit who's inspiring them and filling them and giving them what they need. But talk about a desperate people, desperate for the things of God, desperate for the words of God. They're so desperate because they know this is my lifeline. So they're young and they're babies in, in, in their faith, right? And so Paul's encouraging them and reminding them, this is how to live a countercultural life in the society that you're in. This is how to stand for Christ. This is how to move and live and be. So that's the first thing I do when I study, I think, I get curious, who wrote this? What's this about? Who are they writing it to? Why does it matter? 
And then I start to try to pick out themes. And this is why the word of God is so good because one time I'll read it and I'll think, oh, this is what it's talking about. And something will be highlighted to me. And then I'll read it again. I'm like, oh, no, forget that. This is what, right? And so you might read this and you'll pick up other things. But these are a couple of the things that were just on my mind when I read it. Is that okay if I share that with you? So the first theme that I saw is this idea of God's will for your life and for my life. And how do you know God's will for your life? What's the purpose of all this? God, what's your plan? What's your will? What do I do next? What do I do next, God? What's your will? What's your plan? And when you've given your life to Jesus and you've surrendered your life to Jesus, that surrendering happens regularly. That regular question of what's your will today, God? What's your will? So back to that verse where it says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. Check this out. It says, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Oh my gosh, have you been asking, what's the will of God for my life? What should I do next? Here it is. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We can go home right now. There you go, guys. The question you've been asking, (laughs) there it is. So I shared a little bit with the girls yesterday, but... Um, my family's been on this journey. We, we had pastored in Los Angeles. We were um, really for 20 years, we had been there. We had been lead pastors of our church, Vintage Faith, for 11 years. And in this last um, couple months, in this last year, really, we felt God asking us to move. And it was time to release our church and give it to the next leadership and move on to the next thing. And I had no desire to leave Los Angeles I know people have a lot of opinions about it, but I loved it. That's where I was planted. That's where God had me. My kids were growing up there. They were involved in the schools. We were involved in the community. I had a tight, uh, knit group of friends. It was wonderful, and it was was fun, and I live close to the beach, guys. I live close to the beach. And it was just a beautiful life, and I, I really enjoyed it, and I felt called there. And But all of a sudden, the Lord started to do something different. And a few years ago, we had bought this house um, up in the mountains because, you know, we were never going to afford a house in Los Angeles. It's pretty expensive. I I heard you guys know a little something about that. And um, so we went far away into the mountains to buy a house. And we rented it out on Airbnb. And we thought, oh, one day, you know, we might retire there or sell it or whatever. And it was an investment. And um, and so when we started to hear the Lord say, okay, something's going to change here. Time's going to change. Um, we thought, well, we, we really don't know what is next and we didn't want to move too fast. We didn't want to move before the Lord and make a decision that felt right to us but wasn't what he was asking us to do. So we said, why don't we go live in our, in our cabin and settle in and, and, and just see what God does and wait on him and rest and, and be with, you know, as a family. So I don't know if you know this, but there's a real big difference between Los Angeles and the mountains. And I uh, have three girls who have grown up in the city, you know, like they, they, they have everything at their fingertips. They, I was telling the girls last night, I had three targets, three targets within five minutes of each direction. Okay, I have no targets now. There's no target. There's no Starbucks. There's nothing. All right. I just, I'm up in the mountains with the birds and the raccoons. And, um, and so I have these three little girls that all they've known is the city. And it's so funny because what they didn't realize is they were, they, they were growing up in, in, you know, it wasn't the safest place that we were, we were living. And, um, but they felt safe. And apparently, you know, they, they go up to the mountains and they're like, what is this? Where are we? And we decided we're going to take our girls on a hike. But this was, um, this was like a beginner's hike, okay? This was literally a paved driveway through some trees, okay? And we called it a hike because we're from the city. And so we get out there and my, my Mabel, my six-year-old, we're walking out and she goes, she's looking around. I'm like, come on guys, we're, you know, we're on this hike. Let's go, look at the trees. Look at how beautiful this is. And she goes, are we gonna die out here? <laughs> and I'm like, what? She's like, are we... <gasps> We could fall down this hill. Are there animals out here? You know, and I'm thinking, 
you lived in this in Los Angeles, like greater chance of dying at any point on those streets. And here you are. And so we're in this season in this time where I'm like, God, what is the purpose of this? What is your will, God? Can I tell you one more story about the mountains? They want to know it, so I'm going to tell them. I was in my room, and we live in this, it's beautiful A-frame. It's beautiful. I'm in my room, and I'm studying. This is a couple weeks ago, and I get up, I leave. I come back, and on my bedspread, I see a little, little, can I say poop, poop nugget on my, on my bed. And I'm like, do I have a, is there a mouse? Oh, my gosh. Not a fan. I mean, I'm not a fan, but I'm, like, trying not to freak out. Okay? So I'm like, did I get up, and that mouse came up onto my bed? I'm like, no, it, maybe it's old. I don't know. I was trying to convince myself of things. And I said, okay, I'm just going to clean it up. I leave. I come back. I see another one. Oh, this rascal's getting me. Like, I'm, I'm getting up. I'm leaving. They're coming, and they're like, eh, you know, on my bed. You're like, I heard you're from the city. <laughs> rude, rude. So I wait because I don't want to freak out my kids. But I'm freaking out. And so my husband comes in, we put the kids to bed, my husband comes in, I'm like, listen, we have a situation. I haven't seen it yet, but there's a mouse in here because it keeps jumping up on this bed. So we have a problem. I can't sleep in here. I can't be here. And he's like, well, where, you know, I haven't seen anything. I said, I know, I haven't seen anything. And then as he's talking and I'm like looking around, he goes like this. He gets, he gets a flashlight out of, the, out of the cabinet and he comes over and he goes, and he puts it up in the this A-frame, and he's flashing a light, and I, I see something, and I'm like, what is that? And he's looking at it, and he's like, I need you to leave the room right now. And I'm like, what is happening? So I leave the room, and he comes out. He, shuts, he just shuts the door, and he said, um, there's a bat hanging in our room. Lord, what is your will? What is the plan, God? And it's like a week before Halloween. I'm like, it's demonic. The enemy sent an assignment to me. Come on. So we go through life sometimes and we're like, what's the purpose of this? What's your will in this, God? How should I be in this moment with a bat hanging over my head in my bedroom, and how long has it been there? Do you know what I mean? We took care of the bat. It's gone now. But it forces us sometimes in life where we have to go, what is your will, God? What is the plan here? What is the purpose? And I go back to this, this verse, rejoice always. Rude. Pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And this is what I want to say. This is why the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, can write these words down and say, God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Because he understands this idea of abiding in. He understands this idea of being covered by Jesus' blood. And that is what brings us in. Colossians 3.3 says, For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So the, his, God's will for you to do those things is in Christ Jesus. You can't do those things on your own. You can't rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances if you're not in Christ. You can try. You can muster it up for a time in a season. It won't last. It will not stand the test of time. When a trial comes, you will crumble if you're not in Christ. Christ Jesus. John 15, 5, it talks about this. I am the vine. This is Jesus. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Listen to this. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Sorry, I'm shouting. Apart from me, you can do 
nothing. You can't rejoice always. You can't pray continually. You can't give thanks in all circumstances apart from him. Do you see how awesome this is? That Paul's like, hey, do these things. This is the will of God. And you can't do it without him. This is what you gotta do, but guess what? You gotta be in him to do it. Down in verse John 15, eight, it says, this is my father's glory that you bear much fruit. This is what happens when you're connected in and you remain in him. It's the father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Verse 10, if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Verse 11, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Remember Jesus said that it was the joy set before him. He endured the cross. That's the kind of joy you wanna live in. That's the kind of joy you need, am I right? That you would even go through such pain and death, but it was the joy set before him that he endured that. And this verse right here tells me that if I have told you this, that my joy, that same joy that was set before him may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Our joy is lacking. Our joy needs help, sometimes medicated help, so that we can have some joy. And what Jesus is saying is, if you remain in me, my joy becomes yours. This is how we can rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances when we are in him. If you are a branch that has been disconnected from the vine, you will die You'll be thrown into the fire. There's no purpose or need. But when you remain connected, you remain close, you remain, all those nutrients come to you as well. That same joy comes to you as well. What do you need in the last days? You need to be connected into him. What do you need in the final moments? You need his joy. I don't know if you watch the news lately. I need his joy. I need to be infused in. We exchange our sin for his righteousness when we are covered by him. His blood covers us. For if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, the new has come. So as I read this passage and I look, I see that first theme is, how do I know the will of God for my life? It's to be in Christ. In Christ. Really quickly, how do you know if you're remaining in? What fruit are you producing in your life? Do a fruit check. Guarantee if you go to the grocery store and you pick up a kiwi and you bring it home and you slice it open, you're not gonna get a banana. Hopefully you get a kiwi. And what we talk to our our girls all the time is the fruit of the spirit. What is being produced in your life? So how do you know if you're remaining? How's the, the fruit? What's showing up? But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, ways to remain, repent, often keep a short account with God. This takes humility, it takes being teachable, being open. How else do you remain? Continue to obey when you hear the Lord or you sense the Lord or you read something in the word, obey it. 
When you come to church and you're stirred by something, leave this place and obey the word of God and do it. Put it into practice. What we say to our kids is you need to obey right away, all the way, and with a happy heart. So I got three little girls that I ask them to do something and they don't want to do it. I say, oh, 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 we obey right away. Okay, mom. And with a happy heart. Oh, they love that one. They love that way. And all the way. Sometimes we obey this much. We're like, well, I tried. Continue to obey all the way. So the other theme that I, I see, and, we're, and we're, we're coming, we're not coming to a close, I lied to you. We're, <laughs> but the second theme that I kind of see and sense when I'm reading this, so that first one is the will of God. What is the will of God? Well, it's showing me this, to be in Christ. That's the only way I'm gonna be able to rejoice always and pray continually. There's no, there's no hope. There's no hope to do those things if you're not in Christ, okay? So also this should take the pressure off of you a little bit. Take the pressure off of you. You can't do it, but you can in him. So the, the, the second theme that I kind of see is this idea of this lifelong posture with him when it talks about always, continually, in all things, that that's longevity, that's continued, that's not just on Sunday and then on Monday I do what I want. That is a lifelong pursuit. That's lifelong posture of how I will show up and how I will be. This implies um, always, continually, in all circumstances. God's will is that this is always done. A life lived out in him. Many of you, when you gave your life to the Lord, like, man, like, how beautiful and wonderful. But it's kind of like when you get married, it's wonderful, and that wedding day is wonderful. But you continue to grow. You continue to discover new things. Some are surprising but you continue to live a life together. You continue to walk it out. And this relationship with Jesus was not meant to be one prayer, one and done. That might get you to heaven, but he desires and wants a lifelong relationship that grows and develops. And when I see that, that's what I see is these words of always and continually. It's not just for a one day, it's for your life. So how can we rejoice always, pray continually, and in all circumstances give thanks? Well, we know that we need to be in Christ to do that. But there's just a couple other ideas that I have. And obviously, your amazing pastors and teachers are gonna go even deeper into this in this series. But I wanted to just give you this quick snapshot of some practicals that we could kind of grab onto and say, okay, I wanna live a life like this. I, I need to be in Christ. I need to be, um, I wanna pray. I, I mean, no, I wanna be rejoicing. I want these things. But what are just some practical ways? So one is don't allow yourself to grow too familiar. When I travel and I come home, I'll, be, I'll fly home to this afternoon and I'll come into the house and it will be as if I've only been gone since Friday, but it will be as if my kids have not seen me for months. Mom, you're home, and it's the best. And my husband, oh, babe, I'm so glad you're home, and gives me a kiss, and oh, it's amazing, and it lasts for about five minutes. And then it's, well, mom, can you get me this? And mom, can you get me that? And, and tomorrow morning when I wake them up for school, they're, oh, I wish you weren't here. Dad wakes me up so much better, you know? <laughs> and I wonder how much I just, it it's becomes familiar again. Mom's just home. I'm nothing special at home. Let me just tell you. Like, I'll be like, hey, guys, I preach to a room full of amazing people. Like, we don't care. Make us spaghetti, you know? Like, But I wonder in our own lives if the Lord has just become all too familiar. And familiar isn't bad. 
I mean, we want to, like, I love that my kids are comfortable with me. I love that when I come in, it's like, oh, you know, we've, we've known you, we know you and we love you and it's just familiar and it's cozy. But when, when you stop appreciating, when you stop recognizing the person in the room with you, right? When you live at home and it's, you know, with your spouse, it becomes roommate status. It's too familiar. There's all these studies out right now that, where they say couples, they should, they should um, kiss for 30 seconds every day. They should look into each other's eyes for 30 seconds every day. I'm like, who has time for 30 seconds? You know what I mean? <laughs> Who's got time for that? <laughs> Sounds ridiculous, right? But it's just this idea of getting out from the familiar and going, hey, I see you. And let's get real awkward and look at each other for 30 seconds. And let's have contact and let's, when you come home, you say, hi, it's so good to see you. And you make eye contact and you look at that person, you give them a kiss, you give them a hug, you you see your kids when you get, you you pick them up and you're not like, so how was the math test? No, you look at them and you say, hey, how was your day? I missed you. Oh my gosh, I missed you so much. It's so good to see you. And you take, you step outside from the familiar and you acknowledge and you recognize. And I think in our own life, in our own walk with Christ, it's really easy to get too familiar. And then we have these moments where a crisis hits and we're like, God, I need 30 seconds of your eyes, you know? And then we're pursuing and we want to see him and we want to hear his voice. And then we get real familiar again. So this idea of rejoicing always, praying continually, giving thanks and all, sorts, this lifelong pursuit, this lifelong posture that I want to take is I don't want to get too familiar. I want to stay in love. I want to stay curious. I want to stay interested. The Apostle Paul, the same one who wrote this letter, he writes another letter to the church of Philippi and he reminds them in Philippians 4.4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. It's a lifelong pursuit. Keep rejoicing. Keep getting excited about the things of God. You should hear a story of what God is doing and be so excited. Don't get familiar with it. Don't get familiar with what he's done in your life, remind yourself of where he's brought you and what he's brought you out of. Remind yourself. Don't get familiar with it. Tell your testimony. Share the good news with someone. Hey, have you heard what God did for me? Don't get familiar with his goodness. Don't get familiar with his faithfulness. Rejoice in it and tell somebody about it. The second thing is practice, say practice, a life of prayer. I'm saying practice because it's a practice. There is no gold star medal to praying. You're not going to get a trophy. You're not trying to reach a certain level of heaven with your prayers. Practice. Praying, practice a life of prayer. And just really quick, each morning on the way to school, this is what we practice with our kids, is we say, what do you need from Jesus today? What do you need from Jesus? Many times, because we talk about the fruit of the Spirit in my home, many times they'll, they'll list a fruit of the Spirit. I need um, patience. I need self-control. And I say, yes, you do, my friend. And we pray. And what we do is this thing called a breath prayer. Can I teach you this? Because this is just a practice that I like to use. Is you breathe in the name of Jesus and you breathe out that thing that you're desiring or you're needing or that you're seeking. So I breathe in Jesus and I'll say something like, you are the joy that I need. And it's just a practice. We're practicing a life of prayer. The second you start to get your checklist out and it needs to be you in a prayer closet with a shawl and a Bible and a cup of tea, it's not gonna happen. But when you just practice a life of prayer, and what is prayer? It's talking and communing with God. 
and you take off the religiosity of it and you just say, it's talking with my father and I want to just be close because I don't want to be familiar. I want to seek you and know you. And the Bible says when you seek, you'll find. And so God, I want to find you. And I'm just in my car in this carpool lane. And I just, Hi, Jesus, I need you today. Let me breathe you in. Let me breathe you out. Practice a life of prayer. And the last one is I want to tell you, get your magnifying glass out. Where it says, give thanks in all circumstances. This does not say give thanks for all circumstances. It says in all circumstances. There's a difference there. You can be going through a really difficult thing and you can say that you don't like it. This isn't saying, you know, yeah, give thanks for that circumstance. It's terrible. It's awesome. You better be giving thanks for it or you're not a true Christian. It's saying give it thanks in all circumstances. So whatever you find yourself in, you can still have a posture of thanksgiving. Not that you're happy that thing is happening, but while you're in all circumstances, you can be giving thanks to God. You can be reminding yourself of the times he's come through, the times that he's shown up in that circumstance. And you can still at the same time be in that circumstance, thanking God for who he is and what he's done and be mad about the circumstance you're in. This isn't fair, I don't like this, there's bats, but in this, I'm thankful for you, God, that you're guiding me and you're directing me and that you're with me and that you never leave me. And why do I say get your magnifying glass out? Because in Psalm 34, three to five, it says, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Oh, magnify the Lord. And what, it, what, it, what I hear when I say give thanks in all circumstances, I get my magnifying glass out and I can put it on the circumstance and that becomes real big to me or I can put it on God. Where it says, oh, magnify the Lord. Get your magnifying glass out and put it on the one to be magnified. Don't magnify the circumstance. It's so much easier to magnify the circumstance, isn't it? And then get with your friends and talk about the circumstance and talk about how unfair and unjust and how terrible it is. Get that magnifying glass onto Jesus. How in the world are we going to do these things? Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. We're gonna know that the will of God is for us to be in Christ, to be postured and seated in such a way that we begin to live a life in him, covered in him. I could have walked here today from the San Bernardino Mountains, but I would have been late and I would have been in bad shape. But I got in an airplane and I got in a car from the airplane and I got transported here. It matters what you are in. It matters what you are covered in. And when you give your life to Jesus, the blood of Jesus washes over you. You are in him. You can't do this life without him. You can try and you will fail. And the people around you need to be in Christ. They need to walk by your plate and go, what are you eating? Man, I need that. And you could say, I am in Christ Jesus. That is what we need, amen? Okay, we're gonna have some table time. It's gonna be short because I preached too long. Go ahead, turn to your, turn to your table, talk it out. Talk it out.